Welcome to day 18 of 365, where we study and read the Bible together. And today we're reading Exodus 5 through 7, but y'all already know what to do. Go ahead and hit the like button so the word of God can spread out to more people. Also, leave a comment letting me know where you're watching this from. Where are you from? So I can see how God is bringing people from all over into this one community to get to know him more. Now, let us pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this divine appointment. God, today we just ask that you just have your will. You just have your way. God, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, I just ask that you bless all the readers and listeners in their respective places and spaces. Allow them to be able to remove all distraction from them so they can focus on your word and open their hearts to what you have for them to receive on today. God, I ask that this word be something that comforts them. This word be something that encourages them. And this word is something that will bring them closer to you. Lord, we appreciate you. And we just can't wait to learn more about you through your word and seek your face on a daily. God, I just ask that on this day and every day moving forward that you just speak through me. Use me as a vessel to speak to your people. This and many more blessings in your name. In Jesus name. Amen. In chapter five, the children of Israel are dealt with more harshly and the burdens have increased after Moses and Aaron talked to Pharaoh, which is something that God expected when he told Moses and Aaron to tell Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go. God knew that Pharaoh was not going to easily let go of the people of Israel as his slaves. In response to this, the Pharaoh called them idle. In other words, he called them lazy and he increased the hardship without lowering the quota. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please, let us go three days' journey into the desert and sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people from their work? Get back to your labor. Look, the people of the land are many now, and you make them rest from their labor. So the same day, Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their officers, you shall no longer give the people straw to make brick as before. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. I think it's important to note that in verses 8 through 9, we see why Pharaoh increases the hardship. And it's because he wants them to be so focused and so panicked on trying to reach their quota and working hard that they forget about God. And you shall lay on them the quota of bricks which they made before. You shall not reduce it, for they are idle. Therefore they cry out, saying, Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Let more work be laid on the men, that they may labor in it, and let them not regard false words. Doesn't that sound familiar? Working hard putting tons of hours in, hard labor, grinding, just to meet our daily requirements or our monthly requirements when we're talking about our bills and all these different things that are required of us that society and the world puts on us. So much so that we could work all day and not have enough energy or not even think about God because we're so tired or because we have all these other things that we're prioritizing over him. And it's very similar to what Pharaoh's doing here, or at least what he's attempting to do. He wants to drive up the hard labor, make it harder for them to even do their daily quota. So now it's not enough leisure time to even think about praising God or sacrificing to God. And we see that our society kind of does the same thing to us, where we have all these bills due and we work five. Some people work seven days a week and it can be difficult 
especially if you have family too, it can be really difficult to make time for God. Because just as the Hebrews are slaves to Egypt, we can see how we can easily become slaves in our own life. So it's important that no matter what's going on in our life, no matter what's popping up or what's happening, we make sure that we prioritize God and we keep him first. Because as we see, the more we read, God is the one who breaks every chain. And the taskmasters of the people and their officers went out and spoke to the people. Thus says Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go, get yourselves straw where you can find it. Yet none of your work will be reduced. So the people were scattered abroad throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble instead of straw. And the taskmasters forced them to hurry. Fulfill your work, your daily quota, as when there was straw. Also the officers of the children of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and were asked, Why have you not fulfilled your task in making brick both yesterday and today as before? Then the officers of the children of Israel came and cried out to Pharaoh, saying, Why are you dealing thus with your servants? There is no straw given to your servants, and they say to us, Make brick. And indeed, your servants are beaten, but the fault is in your own people. You are idle. Idle. Therefore you say, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Therefore go now and work, for no straw shall be given you, yet you shall deliver the quarter of bricks. And the officers of the children of Israel saw that they were in trouble after it was said, you shall not reduce any bricks from your daily quota. And as they came out from Pharaoh, they met Moses and Aaron, who stood there to meet them. And they said to them, Let the Lord look on you and judge, because you have made us abhorrent in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants, to put a sword in their hand to kill us. So Moses returned to the Lord. Lord, why have you brought trouble on this people? Why is it you have sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people. Neither have you delivered your people at all. In chapter 6, the children of Israel are no longer listening to Moses and Aaron because last time they did, things only got worse. They're second guessing the Lord because of their circumstances. Isn't that relatable? How many times have we questioned if God was actually going to come through or even second guess what we prayed about because as soon as we prayed it, things got worse. If that's you or has ever been you, just wait till the chapter six summary and I got you. Then the Lord said to Moses, now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand he will let them go, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, Lord, I was not known to them. I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, in which they were strangers. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage. And I have remembered my covenant. In verse 5, when God says that he has remembered, it doesn't mean that he actually forgot. It just means that now is the time where he's going to act on his promise. Therefore, say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. I will take you as my people and I will be your God. 
Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I will give it to you as a heritage. In verses 6 through 8, we notice that the Lord repeatedly says, I will. And that's to emphasize that everything that's about to occur is happening from his strong hand. It's also to reassure to Moses that the Lord is with him and that he will come through on his promise. I am the Lord. So Moses spoke thus to the children of Israel, but they did not heed Moses because of anguish of spirit and cruel bondage. And the Lord spoke to Moses, Go in, tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the children of Israel go out of his land. And Moses spoke before the Lord, The children of Israel have not heeded me. How then shall Pharaoh heed me, for I am of uncircumcised lips? And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, and gave them a command for the children of Israel and for Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. In verse 12, when Moses speaks of uncircumcised lips, he is expressing a sense of inadequacy because of his speech impediment or his speech difficulties. This is a metaphorical way of saying that he is inadequate or unqualified to communicate God's message. This ties with circumcision being a sign of God's covenant, and because of this, God allows Aaron to be his spokesman. These are the heads of their father's houses. The sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, were Hanuk, Palu, Hezron, and Carmi. These are the families of Reuben. And the sons of Simeon, were Jemuel, Jamin, Ohad, Jakin, Zohar, and Shaul, the son of a Canaanite woman. These are the families of Simeon. These are the names of the sons of Levi, according to their generations. Gershon, Kohath, and Mirerai. And the years of the life of Levi were 137. The sons of Gershon were Libni and Shimei, according to their families. And the sons of Kohath were Amram, Izhar, Hebron, and Aziel. And the years of the life of Kohath were 133. The sons of Mirerai were Malai and Mushai. These are the families of Levi, according to their generations. Now Amram took for himself Jacobed, his father's sister, as wife, and she bore him Aaron and Moses. And the years of the life of Amran were 137. The sons of Izhar were Korah, Nepheg, and Zikrai. And the sons of Aziel were Mishael, Elzaphan, and Zithrai. Aaron took to himself Elishaba, daughter of Aminadab, sister of Nasha, as wife. And she bore him Nadab, Abihu, Eliezer, and Ithamar. And the sons of Korah were Azar, Elkanah, and Abiasaph. These are the families of the Korahites. Eliezer, Aaron's son, took for himself one of the daughters of Putiel as wife. And she bore him Phineas. These are the heads of the fathers' houses of the Levites, according to their families. These are the same Aaron and Moses, to whom the Lord said, Bring out the children of Israel from the land of Egypt, according to their armies. These are the ones who spoke to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring out the children of Israel from Egypt. These are the same Moses and Aaron. And it came to pass, on the day the Lord spoke to Moses in the land of Egypt, that the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, I am the Lord. Speak to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all that I say to you. 
Behold, I am of uncircumcised lips, and how shall Pharaoh heed me? Y'all yeah, already know what time it is. I got my notes here and today I'm going to be doing my chapter summary on chapter six. And the message that we want to extract from chapter six is can you have patience in the middle of pressure? Psalms 46 and 10 says, be still and know that I am God. Although understandably, this is something that the Hebrews are really struggling with right now. And I wish that they had Romans 12 and 12 like me and you do. Romans 12 and 12 says, rejoicing in hope patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. Understanding that patience means more than just waiting. It means to wait well. Keep confidence, knowing that the Lord's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, where do we fit in all this? Well, this is a message of encouragement through difficulty, right? We have to make sure that when we're going through our trials and our tribulations, that we are rejoicing in hope, that we are patient in tribulation, and that we are continuing steadfastly in our prayer. Meaning that when times get rough, we don't stop believing what God said just because things are moving to our timeline or they're not moving as fast as we want because God's time is the best time and he always shows up on time. In chapter seven, God instructs Moses and Aaron to confront Pharaoh with miracles that showcase God's power However, Pharaoh's magicians also replicate those miracles. See, I have made you as God to Pharaoh, and Aaron your brother shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you, and Aaron your brother shall tell Pharaoh to send the children of Israel out of his land. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. But Pharaoh will not heed you, so that I may lay my hand on Egypt and bring my armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. Then Moses and Aaron did so, just as the Lord commanded them, so they did. And Moses was eighty years old, and Aaron eighty-three years old, when they spoke to Pharaoh. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, when Pharaoh speaks to you, saying, Show a miracle for yourselves, then you shall say to Aaron, Take your rod, and cast it before Pharaoh, and let it become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went in to Pharaoh, and they did so, just as the Lord commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh, and before his servants, and it became a serpent. But Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, so the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. For every man threw down his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods, and Pharaoh's heart grew hard, and he did not heed them as the Lord had said. In verse 12, we read that Aaron's rod swallows up the magician's rods, letting us know that God has authority over them, showing that man can imitate, but he can't duplicate the power in which God can create. We have to make sure that we understand that God knew that these signs would make Pharaoh become more stubborn and further his disbelief. God's plan is to show all of Egypt and his people the wonders in which he's capable of performing and he's doing that through Pharaoh's stubbornness. So the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hard. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning when he goes out to the water, and you shall stand by the river's bank to meet him. And the rod which was turned to a serpent you shall take in your hand, and you shall say to him, the Lord God of the Hebrews has sent me to you, saying, 
Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. But indeed, until now, you would not hear. Thus says the Lord, By this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will strike the waters which are in the river with the rod that is in my hand, and they shall be turned to blood. And the fish that are in the river shall die, the river shall stink, and the Egyptians will loathe to drink the water of the river. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Say to Aaron, Take your rod, and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their streams, over their rivers, over their ponds, and over all their pools of water, that they may become blood. And there shall be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in buckets of wood and pitchers of stone. And Moses and Aaron did so, just as the Lord commanded. So he lifted up the rod and struck the waters that were in the river, in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants. And all the waters that were in the river were turned to blood. The fish that were in the river died. The river stank. And the Egyptians could not drink the water of the river. So there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. Then the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments, and Pharaoh's heart grew hard, and he did not heed them, as the Lord had said. And Pharaoh turned and went into his house, neither was his heart moved by this. So all the Egyptians dug all around the river for water to drink, because they could not drink the water of the river. And seven days passed after the Lord had struck the river. And that's all for day 18. So I appreciate you being here. And if this was a blessing to you, go ahead and share this with three other people who need to hear this too. And I'll see you on day 19. Peace.